I'm very pleased to be here this evening. I'd like to discuss a remarkable Frenchman. He was a great fencer. He was a composer. He was a conductor. He was a violinist, an artful equestrian. He was an exceptional marksman. He was an elegant dancer. He was an accomplished man who knew many important people, such as the Duke of Orléans, who was his protector, and also the Duke was the cousin of Louis the Fifteenth. He also knew the Prince of Wales, who was a very good friend of his, who later became King George the Fourth. He also knew Marie Antoinette and her husband, King Louis the Sixteenth. He was able to dress in a way that made heads turn everywhere. So he was a fashion plate. So think about it. Here we have a fencer, we have a dancer, a marksman, an artful equestrian. He did all of these things, an elegant dancer, and with all of that, he was spoken of highly to or with the bourgeoisie of France. As I said, he walked among royalty, and he became known as the greatest fencer in France. He also served as a French colonel in the army during the French Revolution. Serving under him was the lieutenant colonel Alexander Dumas, who was the father of Alexander Dumas, the author of The Three Musketeers, The Count of Monte Cristo, and other great literary works. He was known as a kind, gentle, generous man. As I said, he was constantly discussed with or between the bourgeoisie because of his exotic look, because of his manner, because of his class manner. Even the future president of the United States, John Adams, second president of the United States, in his diary of May 17, 1790, uh, 1779, wrote, Saint-Georges is the most accomplished man in Europe in running, in riding, in fencing, in dancing, and of course in music. Adam says he could hit the button, any button on the coat of the greatest fencing masters. He will hit a crown piece, a coin, and the head of that coin with a pistol ball, a handgun. So he was able, from a distance, to point a gun and shoot at the head and get it every time. He was quite a marksman. On Christmas Day, 1745, on the island of Guadeloupe, which was a French island in the West Indies, he was born. His father was a wealthy planter from a very prominent family. The father's name was Georges, Georges Bologna de Saint-Georges. His mother's name was Nanon. She became known as La Belle Nanon. His mother was a slave. Let me introduce to you Joseph Bologna Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges, a man for all seasons.
listening to that, one might think, gosh, that sounds a lot like Mozart or even Haydn. Uh, again, it was written during the Classic period. Actually, the Classic period uh, began in 1750 and ended about approximately 1820. Some people say 1827. But basically, it began in about 1750. It was a period based on balance and symmetry. We'll talk a little more about that later. But before I do that, this black man, Joseph Bologna de Le Savalia de Saint Georges, as I said, was born in the French island of Guadeloupe. His father, wanting the best for his son, recognized that Guadeloupe would not recognize him and he could never take his place as a landed gentry or a gentleman. In France, slavery had been outlawed. Though it still existed in the French colonies, such as Guadeloupe, where planters made fortunes from slave labor. George, Joseph's father, had taken steps with the authorities to make sure that his son and Nanon, his mistress, were no longer slaves. George loved his son, even though George was married to a woman by the name of Elizabeth, a French woman. And she also had a daughter named Elizabeth as well. He decided, as I've said, that uh, Guadeloupe was not a place to raise his son. So therefore, he moved the entire family. Joseph, Nanon, his wife, and his daughter. Now, you know, that gets a little, you know, shaky in there, but <laughs> nevertheless, he did it. And nobody raised an eyebrow about it, because quite frankly, in the books that I've read, there's not a lot of mention of the Elizabeths in his life. It all seems to be centered around Saint George. Uh, so he decided to sell his plantation and move to France where he would be accepted as a gentleman. Before leaving for Paris, George wanted a title for his son. His new name would be Joseph Bologna Le Chevalier de Saint George. Now, what is a chevalier? That is tantamount to a English knight. So he would really be known as Sir Joseph. Sir Joseph. Now, why could the father get away with this? Because the father worked for the king, Louis XV. He, was, uh, he had a job in his service. So he was an aristocrat and was able to do many things that aristocrats were able to do. In Paris, status was everything. To be rich was important, but being an aristocrat was even better. George the father was determined that his son Joseph would excel at all the pastimes of a chevalier. At 13, Joseph was sent to board at one of France's most prestigious fencing schools. And uh, this academy was run by a master swordsman by the name of Le Boissier. Uh, mornings at this academy were spent in mathematics, history, languages, music, art, dance, and horsemanship. The afternoons were taken up totally with 
fencing, a skill at which every young aristocrat had to excel. Within a few years, Joseph was the best fencer in the school. It also helped that he was the tallest Frenchman in the school. Swordsmen from around Europe wanted to challenge him when word spread that he was such a great swordsman. He was the best the school had, and people challenged him. At the school, each student had to fight other students. One student aristocrat made a snide remark about having to fence with a half caste. The usual gentle Joseph picked him up and threw him across the room to the cheers of the rest of the onlooking student body. Very out of character for him. Another incident happened when a master swordsman, Picard from Rouen, challenged Le Boissier's mulatto. Now that was an insult too. George didn't like it. So he really didn't want to fight him. But his father, who was quite ambitious for his son, said, if you fight uh, Picard, I will give you the finest cabriolet that money can buy. Now, a cabriolet is a carriage drawn by one horse. It's a very elegant carriage. I guess it would be tantamount to a Porsche <laughs> by today's standards. You will see later, Joseph was a stylist. Every, I mean, he dressed in the finest clothes. He went around. Everybody knew who he was as a fencer. But guess what happened? There was a master swordsman named Faldoni, and he was from Italy, and he too wanted to fight this great Saint George. Well, the duel was set, and Saint George, Joseph, knew that this guy was really a master, and he was quite a few years older. He had been a master for a long time. Crowds came to see this great event, and to make the long story short, Faldoni won the duel. Four touches to Joseph's two. This was the first time that he had lost. The first time. So he took it pretty hard. But he said to himself, there are other things that I can do. I'll show the world what else I can do. Because of his father's ambition, he too became very ambitious and was most in interested, driven to be accepted as an aristocrat in France. Now, all along, George had been studying the violin. All along, he had been studying the violin. And he was studying with uh, a very great teacher in France, Jean-Marie Laclaire. If there are any violinists in here, some of you, I'm sure, have played the violin music of Leclerc. Well, anyway, George studied the violin with Leclerc. And Leclerc was so taken with this young student because he was really a virtuoso violin player, as well as a fencer. Who ever heard of that? A fencer, an athlete, as well as a virtuoso violinist. Unheard of. It doesn't make sense. It sounds like a soap opera. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, he was one of the finest violin students that Leclerc had. So guess what Leclerc did? He wrote six sonatas and dedicated them to Joseph Bologna, Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges. How do you like that? Now, what great teacher does that to students? 
actually writes music and dedicates it to them. He also studied with Joseph Gossek. He studied composition with Joseph Gossek. Before long, uh, he was so famous that everybody started talking about his prowess. How, as they said, he could do with the violin bow what he did with the sword. At parties and grand houses, he was invited to show off his musical skills. Look, they already knew who he was as a fencer. Now they were introduced to him as a great violinist. His fingers would dance on the keys, or on the strings rather, as he played swooping runs and dazzling trills to the thrill of the audience. In 1769, Joseph became first violinist of the largest orchestra in Paris. It was at these concerts d'amateur. Now you think an amateur is a person who has a daytime job and just plays, you know, for fun. But that's not the case here. At the concert des amateurs, these concerts were for professional musicians who took music seriously. It was not for the neophyte. This was a time when he was asked to become the concert master of this orchestra. Unheard of. Two years later, he wrote two concertos for that orchestra, and he became the conductor of that orchestra. Now, who ever heard of a black man in France where slavery was outlawed, but still there was that ceiling? Who ever heard of a black man being able to conduct a great orchestra? Not heard of. George was uh, Joseph was breaking all of the stereotypes. Now, uh, one of the things about uh, Joseph's music, it is extremely difficult for the violinist because, you know, they were amazed at the way he could use the bow of the violin. It was like using a sword. And, you know, he was the greatest fencer France had produced. So the fact that he was able to play the way he fenced, his music was extremely difficult. Why? Because... He, the, the fingerboard, he would be way up at the very edge of the fingerboard for one second, and then, boom, have to come all the way down to play a low note. Let's listen, if we can, to an example of a concerto that Saint-Georges wrote, which demonstrates what I just said. In 1774, Joseph received a special envelope. It had a wax seal with the royal crest stamped on it. France's new young queen, Marie Antoinette, had heard of this renowned Saint-Georges. Would he come to the palace to play music with her? He did, and the queen was impressed, very impressed, with his playing and manner. Joseph was told the queen would be pleased to receive him at Versailles more often. Joseph, of course, was overwhelmed, but he went to tell his mother, Nanon, of his good fortune, and he had her laughing when he said, 
I just met the king of France, Louis XVI, who was rather fat and a dull-looking man in a powdered wig. Not the regal king he had imagined. By 1775, Joseph was a celebrated violinist, conducting and a composer, conductor and composer. He was the perfect person to become the director of the Royal Opera. He was the perfect person. Marie went to her husband and says, you must give that position to him. He is France's finest musician. So you must give him the position. But there were a lot of people that thought, well, he's good, but we've never heard of a black man conducting a great orchestra, uh, an opera company like that. No, 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 no. Plus, there were three singers who wrote to the king and says, your royal highness, by giving him that position, that would offend our sensibilities because we would have to take orders from a mulatto. But you know what? This controversy sparked something throughout the whole country. And the question was, this was the first time that people began to ask, could a black person be just as talented as a white one? George suffered many racial indignities, but he had many great triumphs as well. I'm going to play a piece uh, by Saint George. It's his Adagio in F minor. I'm just going to play the first part. Now, you heard the uh, first piece, that orchestra piece. It was called The Anonymous uh, Lover. And that was a happy-go-lucky piece. But George was a solitary man who kept lots of things hidden. You see, he could never really marry into the aristocratic circles because he was black. They accepted him because he was so talented. He was charming. Women swooned over his exotic looks. And men ran up to him because he was a brilliant conversationalist but he could never marry into that, well, I call it estate. There were like three classes of people, and we'll talk about that a little later. But he could never marry into that. And, you know, it made him very sad. So he wrote this adagio, which is a piece of great longing. And you'll hear it. I, I, just last night, uh, I was doing some more research on this piece, and somebody wrote this about the adagio. It's a piece that exudes pain, grief, strength, purity, beauty, and acceptance without hearing a word. Saint-Georges is beautiful. Let me play just the first part of the adagio in F minor by Saint-Georges.
is a longing in that piece. There are other pieces that he wrote, and we'll discuss them in the second part of this program. Thank you so much, Charles. What a fascinating story. And given San Jorge's giftedness, I'm just wondering why have we not heard more about this individual? Well, I, I must tell you that uh, after he died in 1799, you know, he died actually when the French Revolution ended. You know, the year that it ended, he died. Much of his music was burned, lost. However, um, the Tomful Music Orchestra of Canada under female conductor by the name of Jean Lamont revived his symphony and some of his overtures and concertos. Uh, and that orchestra was part of the production of the DVD known as Le Mozart Noir and it was broadcast all over Europe and Canada, and an active interest developed in his music. Again, this is after 200 years of it being in total obscurity. So because of Tafel music and other composers who found music, Gabriel Benet was a biographer, or is a biographer, of Saint-Georges, Gabriel was a former violinist with the New York Philharmonic. And as a violinist, he was always looking for new music. And he went to the New York Public Library and found some of the violin piano sonatas and started studying them. This sparked an interest. And he wrote his book, Le Souvalier de Saint Georges. So more people became interested in the book and the music. Now, let me tell you something else. People are finding out from all over the world that I am now involved with San George. So I am getting emails from all over the globe about people who are interested, who have done studies on San George. And I'm finding out a lot of information that way as well. So, you know, the thing is, uh, when you become interested in a, well, esoteric subject, there are other people out there who become interested as well, and they're willing to share this information. So I am now a part, and I'm honored to be part, of a new network of people who are involved with the music of Saint George and who are spreading the music of Saint George. Wait, one other thing I do want to say. Natalie Hendaris was my piano professor when I was working on a master's at Temple. And she is the one who actually recorded, the first recording of this piece, I was back in the, I think the 70s, in the 70s, that she actually recorded this. This is his only recorded piece, or only published piece in this country at this point. This is it. Everything else is like this, in manuscript form, that you can barely read. But I am sure that within the next two to three years, there's going to be a resurgence of interest in this man. Not because of all the peripheral things that he did, but because of the fact that he was an interesting composer. His music was very melodic, it was very simplistic, but it was very heartfelt at the same time. Yes, my name is Diana Burton, and I am from Roxboro, Pennsylvania. Mr. Petaway, I enjoyed your playing, and my question to you is, how many pieces did uh, St. Sean George compose, and did he play the violin in any of them? Well, yeah, he, he did. As a matter of fact, at the Concert de Amateur, uh, he did write two violin concertos, and he played both the concertos. That's how his renown spread as a violin virtuoso and as a composer as well. You asked how many pieces did he write? Well, he wrote operas, he wrote 
violin, piano sonatas, and he wrote harpsichord sonatas. He wrote 11 harpsichord sonatas. In addition to that, he wrote symphony concertantes, and we're going to talk about that a little later on. But the symphony concertante was a work written for two or more virtuoso players with orchestral accompaniment. Saint-Georges was one of the first to write in that genre. Um, another genre that he wrote in was the string quartet. Now, Franz Joseph Haydn is given credit with writing string quartets, but Saint-Georges was also one who wrote a few string quartets. He wrote 11 keyboard sonatas, and I have to tell you, I have been trying to get those keyboard sonatas for the past year and a half, <laughs> literally. And I just got, well, I even wrote to the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de, de Paris, and they sent me three sonatas for violin and piano. I asked them for the harpsichord sonatas, and they sent me three piano or you know violin pieces. So I've got to go back. But through this project, I met uh, a harpsichordist in Paris, Anne Roberts, and we became good friends. And three weeks ago, she sent me this sonata that I'm going to play tonight. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece, and it's because of her that I now have his sonata number one in C major. But there are 10 others that he wrote that I'm going to try to get as well. Well, I will get them. <laughs> Mr. Pettaway, hello. Um, I'm from Winfield, part of the city of Philadelphia. I'm a school teacher, and I'm just so pleased to be here. My question is, you mentioned that even though this accomplished, fantastic man uh, was in France and slavery had been abolished, he was still mulatto. And I just got the feeling, when you mentioned the three divas who refused to sing as long as he would be the one in charge. I heard that as a red flag. Um, how long of his life did his father's income allow him to sustain maybe these type of rejections? Because most of these artists, eventually they wind up dying penniless. And I'm hoping that's not the case. But I have a feeling that may be. Well, uh, his father uh, left him a pension. His father did ultimately die, but again, he was a very wealthy, wealthy landowner and plantation owner. So his father did leave him a pension, okay? That lasted until the French Revolution, to tell you the truth. Then, of course, he lost everything. Now, he made money also as a soloist, as a violinist, conductor, and composer. But again, when the French Revolution came, he lost everything. You mentioned about the three divas. Let me tell you the rest of the story there. The three divas were upset because they didn't want to take orders from a, a mulatto, but they had other great problems. And these, this is the problem. They were fading divas. <laughs> they had lost their ability to you know, negotiate the difficult runs that were required of great singers. And they knew how demanding Saint George was as a conductor of the other orchestras. So they knew, oh my gosh, if he becomes the director, we're going to be out in the street. We're not going to have a job. See, that's another reason why they wrote the king. I think if they thought, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake, they wouldn't have complained. But that's what they said. We could never take orders from a mulatto. <laughs> the other thing that I just found out the other day, who did become the director? One of the singer's lovers became the interim director of the royal opera. Politics as usual. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ajwa Love Dorsey. I'm from South Philly, but I live in Overbrook Farm, South Philly, always at heart. Mr. Petaway, I guess one question that's pondering me is, why is he called the Black Mozart? Now, what I like about this man and what I've enjoyed most is that he definitely lived outside the box. He's all over the place. He's exotic. 
He didn't conform to the norm. He continued to pers um, pursue. I just like his character. Um, I guess because I'm also an out of the box person. So, but why is he quote unquote considered or called the black Mozart? Good question. Actually, I answer that in, in the second segment. But let, let me just say this. That was never an a official title. That was never an official title. Um, what happened, there were a group of people who were walking along and heard some of his music, like the Anonymous Lover, like his symphony in G major, and said, Gosh, this music sounds a lot like Mozart. So let's call him the Black Mozart. That's all we really know. It was never a pseudoname that was official. But because he wrote in such a way, a group of people decided, let's call him the Black Mozart. And that title stuck. That's it. Good evening, my name is Dr. Cynthia Cosette Lee. I'm a Center City composer, but I'm a native Pittsburgher. And I have a question. First of all, thank you, Mr. Petaway, for this fantastic lecture that you're doing on Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Um, my question to you is, was he the music teacher for Marie, Marie Antoinette? And also, did he meet Mozart? Well, let, let, me, let me deal with uh, Marie Antoinette. He was, for a time, the music teacher of Marie Antoinette, for a time. But the court became quite worried about the music teacher and the queen. <laughs> Why? Because, again, St. George was handsome. He was good looking. He was, well, tall, dark, and handsome. And as a result, the queen was married to Louis the 16th. You saw his picture. <laughs> so having this music teacher, it was quite a great thing. You know, I'm finding out more and more about him as I read. He was quite a lover. And I don't mind saying that. He was quite a lover. He was in some circles known as the Black Don Juan. Okay, he really was quite a ladies' man. And there seems to be some suggestion that the two were having an affair. There seems to be, I don't know for sure. Okay, there seems to be some insinuation that the two were having an affair. Well, the court found out about it and had to put a stop to it. As a matter of fact, this is one of the many times that he tried to, he was almost assassinated. People tried to assassinate him a few times because of his stepping out of the box as far as relationships were concerned. Uh, and uh, he, he was ambushed a few times, but again, he was a great athlete and he could always subdue them. But uh, he was ambushed quite a few times. So I don't know for sure if there was an affair there, but clearly, he did teach her for a while. Not a long while either. <laughs> as I was saying, as Mozart's notoriety spread, he was seen on concert posters with the likes of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who was younger than Saint Georges, and also Franz Joseph Haydn. I want to stop here for just a second, and I want to talk about Mozart. Now, of course, Mozart was a child prodigy who traveled all over Europe and made a big name for himself. Of course, when he died, he died penniless, as one of the uh, questioners asked earlier. Uh, but he did die uh, penniless. But Mozart wrote many, many great works, and if you saw the movie Amadeus, you realize the types of music that he wrote in Solieri and his response to some of this wonderful music. But people don't know that Saint George was one of the first innovators of the Symphony Concertante. 
Now, Symphony Concertante is a large orchestral work written for hmm, dueling instruments, two or more solo instruments played at the same time against an orchestral backdrop. It's like a double concerto or a triple concerto for those who understand what I'm saying. But, but the point is, so Mozart wrote a symphony concertante. According to St. George's biographer, Gabriel Benet, Mozart used this theme that I'm going to play. Listen to this. He used this theme in his symphony concertante. So he starts here. He goes all the way up the fingerboard, and then he drops all the way down here. That's what Saint George was doing. And Gabriel says that Saint George wrote in his second violin concerto the exact same figure. But he wrote it before Mozart. So Benet says that Mozart copied that same figure. The only difference was Saint George wrote it in the key of E major. Okay, Mozart wrote it in E flat major. The same notes. So Mozart stole from Saint George. <laughs> and guess what? It is now bona fide that that's exactly what happened because nobody was writing at the upper register like that and then shooting all the way back down. That was Saint George's style. Okay. Um, Another great composer of the time, actually the greatest composer in France during that period, was Franz Joseph Haydn. Musicians affectionately called him Papa Haydn. Now, this is something that's very interesting, and most people don't realize this. Saint-Georges traveled to Vienna to meet with Franz Joseph Haydn and commissioned Haydn to write six symphonies. They became known as the Paris Symphony. One of the symphonies was named La Reine, which means the Queen, and it was one of the favorite symphonies of Marie Antoinette. Um, these works were really, really quite innovative, and Saint Georges conducted these works with a new orchestra, and that orchestra was known as the Concert de la Loge Olympique. This was his second orchestra that he conducted. Now, this orchestra was founded by the Free Masons of France. Saint George became the first black mason, French black mason, I should say. He was the first French black mason. And he was asked to commission six pieces by the renowned Papa, Mo, uh, Papa Haydn. And he performed all of them with this great orchestra to much critical acclaim. So there were many, many firsts for Saint Georges. At this point, I want to talk a little bit about an important form of the period. What am I talking about? You know, when you listen to music, I don't care what it is, it's written in some sort of form. It could be binary, two-part form, statement and departure. It could be ternary, three-part form, statement, departure, and return to the statement. Sonata Allegro form 
is just like that. It's an extended three-heart form. When you listen to symphonies, when you listen to classical violin sonatas, when you listen to concertos, when you listen to string quartets, most of the music that when you go to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra, if it's a symphony, it follows the form sonata allegro. It's an extended three-part form. Let me just tell you very quickly, there are basically three parts to sonata allegro. One, exposition. 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 That's the first part. This is where there are two dissimilar themes in the first section. Now listen, the first theme is in the tonic key. In other words, if a piece is in C major, then the tonic is C major. The second theme, which is dissimilar to the first theme, is on the dominant, or the fifth degree of the scale. So, we have two contrasting themes. One happy, then the other has to be sad. This is the classical period, balance and symmetry. This is what the classic period was about, balance and symmetry. Every reaction has a reaction. Okay, so in other words, or every action has a reaction. But the point is, this was a period of balance and symmetry. So if one theme was happy, the second theme was sad. That's the exposition. In the development of a sonata, I, I tell my students often that the development is really the improvisation of the two themes. In other words, they use compositional devices where they take just part of the first and second theme and they improvise on it. So the development is created through improvisation. Let me say that at this point. Uh, and then finally we have the recapitulation where the two themes are introduced again. Both themes are now in the tonic key. I'm going to play now the first movement of St. George's Sonata in C major. And we'll hear the first theme in C major, tonic, and we'll hear the second theme in G major, which is the dominant. And then we'll hear a development where he takes those two themes. And then finally we get back to the recapitulation where both themes are in the tonic. So let's listen now to Saint George's Sonata number one in C major. Oh, one other thing. You'll hear throughout this sonata in the bass, known as an Alberti bass. It was created by Domenico Alberti. All the great classical musicians used that accompaniment figure. Saint George went overboard with that same idea. He uses it in all three movements. Let me play now just the first movement of his sonata in C major.
Thank you. Saint George lived among aristocrats and was readily accepted in, shall we say, this rarefied atmosphere because of his celebrity. Women uh, loved him, were intrigued by him because of his exotic looks, and men, because of his erudite conversation, loved to speak with him and his great sense of humor. So everybody rallied around him, and as I said earlier, he was also a wonderful dresser. He went to London and brought back the latest fashions. He went for fencing matches, uh, to get money, by the way, because his money was kind of low. So as a result, uh, his friend, son, the Duke of Orleans' son, and he became very good friends, and they did duels in England. And he brought back the latest fashions from England. So when Saint George was in a room, what's he wearing today? What's he wearing today? I mean, this is the thing. He was a superstar, a real superstar. But in 1789, all of this stopped abruptly. Why? Because of the French Revolution. Bread was hard to come by. Bread was very, very hard to come by. There were these exorbitant taxes uh, given to the poor for salt. And as a result, they went to Marie Antoinette and says, what are we going to do? The subjects are starving. They can't afford the bread. Oh, let them eat cake. You all know that famous phrase of hers. Well, you know, under, well, under Maximilian Robespierre, this was the era of terror. And anybody who looked like they might be a dissident was killed. All aristocrats were killed, including Marie Antoinette. She was taken to the guillotine. And also her husband. Their heads were chopped off. Oh, that was a humane way of doing away with people. Okay, but all of St. George's one by one, all of his friends left. They were being killed. So you know what he did? Well, I'm a black man and, oh gosh, I, I can't use the title Chevalier anymore. So he changed, he took that title away because that was an aristocratic title. So he, he became known as Monsieur St. George. Monsieur, Mr. St. George. Well, because of his renown, he was asked to take part in the French Revolution. And after a time, he became a colonel. What did he know about army strategy? But he became a colonel. Now, I don't know if this is true, but he was the head of a thousand, they use the term colored, men. These freed black men signed up for his regiment. And they fought at the Battle of Lille in France. And they preserved that city, Lille. Because of it, he was considered a revolutionary hero for a time. But this was the era of terror. And what happened? He was later accused of taking monies for his own pleasure. You know, even during the war as a colonel, St. George lived well. He really lived very well. He had a very nice apartment and still dressed the part. And the revolution says you're stealing money that was meant to outfit your soldiers and give them weapons. It was a lie. He didn't do that at all. But nevertheless, that's what they said. So guess what? He was relieved of his command and he was put in jail. He was imprisoned. He was imprisoned. Now, one by one, his aristocratic friends were beheaded. Any day he knew he could be beheaded. The only thing that saved him was, well, he was a colonel working for the resistance, shall we say, the French, uh, the, 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 the peasants, okay, for democracy would be a better word. He was working for liberty and equality. He was working for these things. So 
at the behest of friends to the authorities, they finally released him after a year imprisonment. Okay, so he was out for a year, and the government said, Saint George, we need your help again. Saint George was a Frenchman, and he says, What can I do? We want you to go to Saint Dominique, which is now known as Haiti, and see if you can't talk to their rebel leader, uh, Toussaint Louverture, and see if he will stop his fighting and come back to us. Let us rule, you know, Haiti. Well, he went over there, and he tried to talk to Toussaint Louverture, and he was very sympathetic. What had happened, the slaves had taken over all the plantations, all of them, and they were basically ruling themselves by Louverture. But at the same time, there was a rogue leader who was also trying to take over and was killing many of the natives of this Saint Dominique Haiti. Killing them. As a matter of fact, there's an account that St. George gives where he himself narrowly escaped being killed. He was sick of it. He was sick of the fact that there was so much cruelty and violence. He couldn't take it anymore. He said, the heck with it. I'm going back to France. He went back to France, and that basically was the last time that he worked for the French government. He went back to conducting, and he was conducting a new orchestra, and that new orchestra was called the Le Circle de la Harmonie, the Circle of Harmony, the Circle of Harmony. So this was his third orchestra, and he conducted many works and was given great reviews. Now, this was in 17... 97. He developed an ulcer. He had no money, by the way, because the, the uh, re revolution had you know, taken everything. So he got a one-room apartment and unfortunately died in this one-room apartment. He had two friends who came to see about him, but he had an ulcer. And he thought it would go away, and it didn't. And as a result, he died. So here was a life that was full of triumph and at the same time was full of pain. Let's listen to the concluding part of the Adagio in F minor.
this piece contains all of the pain, the indignities, the fact that he was a celebrity and could never marry, could never marry his one true love, Marie Joseph. Of course, Marie Joseph was married to somebody else. They actually even had a child, but the husband found out about it and told the wet nurse to let it die. And um, so he was devastated over that. So all of this music, all of this pain is found in a lot of his slow movements. Saint-Georges was also an operatic composer, and he wrote quite a few operas as well. I'm going to play the second movement of his Sonata Number no. 1 in C major, and it's very sad, but at the same time, it's very operatic. Let's listen to this. And then finally, the third movement of his sonata is really full of resolve. I almost think it's like his father's resolve for his son to become an aristocratic gentleman. And Saint George, through all of his racial indignities, all of the other sadnesses, was able to transcend all of this, and still write uplifting music for the world to rediscover and enjoy.
Thank you. Thank you. Finally, in the year 2001, a street was renamed to Rue de Savalia de Saint Georges. This was in 2001. It was done at the request of French citizens from the West Indies. Now, the original date on that street change was from 1739 to 1799. If that were the case, he would have been 60 when he died. Mm -hmm. However, Gabriel Benet, again, through his uh, extensive research and others, have now determined that he was born in 1745. And he died in 1799. So that made him die at 54. Again, it was through the efforts of Gabriel Benet. So if you ever go to France, look up the street, Rue de Savalier de Saint-Georges. There are more recordings now that are coming out, French recordings particularly, of his music. But in this country, you can also get some of his music through Tafel Music or through uh, some other um, recording companies. All you have to do to go, all you have to do is go to Amazon.com and type in Saint Georges, and you will find, you know, the music that's available. So that is the story of Saint Georges, an incredible character. And there's much more to the story that I could have told you tonight, but of course it's getting late. So as a result, maybe in the future, you'll have, well, I have whet your appetite enough so that you want to do some reading on your own about this incredible black man, Le Mozart Noir. And you will see that there are indeed people of all nationality, all races, who can do some pretty amazing things through the gift that God gives them. So thank you all very much for being a wonderful audience. I've enjoyed speaking with you and performing with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, what an amazing story this has been. Before we close out our program, we have a couple more questions for you from our audience. Hi. Hi, I'm Carl Middleman, and I'm a musician here in Philadelphia. And thank you for this fascinating presentation. You've drawn attention to how Chevalier de Saint-Georges overcame obstacles of race in Paris of his time. And you've also drawn some attention to uh, similarities between the fiery brilliance of his violin playing and his part writing for the violin and, the, and his fencing. And I'm wondering if you, we can take that even a step further and maybe find sort of military codes in his music. For instance, in the, the sonata that you just played, the first movement it begins with almost what sounds like a fanfare. Whee, boom, boom, boom. And also in the movie, in the second of the film, the clips. It sounded like the uh, violin player was going off on a wild fanfare type riff uh, towards the end of that excerpt. So I wonder whether that occurred to you and whether you think that we can find other examples of military codes in his music. I, I, I don't really know how to answer that question at, that, at this point. That's a really good question. Uh, I'm going to have to do some more research. I've never looked at it that way, nor any of the readings that I've done have insinuated anything to that effect. Uh, most of the pieces that he wrote were written before he became a colonel in the army. So I don't know if there was any code writing, uh, but I will check into that, and I'm sure you will as well. I can't answer that question. <laughs> My name is Jack McCarthy. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm also a musician. Um, I noticed in the first movement of the Sonata in C a lot of similarities to 
the first movement of Mozart's Sonata in C. Uh, a lot of similarities, and I'm wondering which one was written first, and which one do you think influenced the other? I know Chevalier was 11 years older than Mozart, right. I guess, so would his sonata have been written first, and you think that may have influenced Mozart, or the I, other way around? I, I don't know. No, this sonata was written first. Uh, Mozart's Kerschel 545 was written, I don't, it's, it's 1700, but I don't know the exact date. But, you know, it's a Kerschel 545. I thought that way as well. I, I don't mind telling you that because I do hear a similarity. But I can't really say that uh, Saint George or Mozart copied from Saint George. I, I don't know at this point. Um, I had to analyze this work. Uh, I just got the work, quite frankly, from Anne Francis. And um, as a musician, you will notice that in the second theme, there are four measures of transition which really don't belong there, I would think. I mean, they're extended measures. Uh, so if you really listen and analyze the work, I mean, he's following a pseudo Sonata Allegro form, but there are four measures in the exposition and also in the recapitulation which really don't need to be there. That, this part. That part. I'm trying to figure out what's the relevance of that part. It leads on to the second theme, but it's a strange transition, and I really can't make that out yet. So, um, Saint George was not as skilled a composer as Mozart. Uh, I don't know exactly when this sonata number one was written, but I'm hoping to get all 11 of the sonatas, and then I can study them and find out, you know, along with the Mozart works, if Mozart took any music or Saint George, because, you know, let's face it, Handel was borrowing from himself all the time. He borrowed from himself, you know, so... Uh, I can't answer that question either. I, I would tend to think that there's a possibility, but I'm hoping that Mozart wouldn't do that. <laughs> well, Charles, you have taught us so much. How about leaving us with a final thought on Saint-Georges? Um, well, Saint-Georges was truly an incredible man. He was an incredibly generous man. And even though he lived the lap of luxury, he always took time for people less fortunate than himself. And he always remembered, even though he was a superstar, he always remembered who he was and he always thought about the little guy because he recognized if it hadn't been for his father, he would never have made it out of Guadeloupe and he would have been destined to be a slave. It's as simple as that. His father loved him so much that he gave him a new title, he introduced him to, you know, all the gentlemanly things in society. So, you know, the love of a father and his son, even though they were culturally different, you know, when you think about it, the father was white, but he gave everything to the son at the expense of his true wife, you know, and his daughter. Because even today, People don't know about Elizabeth, the daughter. We know that she existed, but there's no history. We don't even know if, they, they, we know what they had to live together for a time, but I don't think there's any account that they really stayed in touch with each other. Maybe she felt that being associated with him would give her a negative name. We don't know at this point. But through it all, and, and through this last uh, movement that I played of his third sonata, there's a resolve there. And he lived that way. So no matter what happened to him in his life, he still resolved to help as many people as he could. And I guess that's what we're all here for. I mean, to help people in the best way that we can, to give of our substance, you know, to help other people who are less fortunate. Clearly he did that. So, I mean, he was a definite role model that I think more people should read about and know. Not only musically, but from a spiritual and moral point of view, he was a great man. Indeed.